If you think Mark Sargent looks bored, you're dead right. For the last three weeks, he's spent countless hours pushing the pedals in a bid to maintain fitness while his ankle took its time healing. The plaster finally came off this week, and the prognosis is great news for Knights fans. If the doctor's quite satisfied that I'm right for the Brisbane game, he'll, he'll let me have a run, but uh, if not, he'll hold, he'll hold off until the, uh, the Balmain game. He seems pretty certain that I'll be right by then. The break has been anything but pleasant. Sarge was in full flight when cruel fate relegated him to the grandstand. It gets a bit nail-biting, especially in matches like the Manly match, which was, which was pretty close, but uh, as long as they're winning, it, it gives me a chance to get back on the field. Like the longer we're in the competition, naturally enough, it's going to be better for me, and uh, they look like they've got us into the semis, so pretty happy about that. A strong showing in the semis would also bring the State of Origin second rower right back into Kangaroo Tour contention. Bruce McKenzie, NBN News. After some atrocious weather midweek, it was a relieved pair of finalists who took to the green in fine conditions to decide the issue. Both had comfortable semi-final wins over some formidable opposition. John Snell had earlier beaten Bob King 31-24, while Jim Dwyer accounted for Rex Johnston and Commonwealth Games gold medalist Rob Perella on his way to the final. Both were in superb form and there were some tense moments. It was a nip and tuck affair on a testingly slow green, but in the end it was the mid-north coaster Snell who prevailed by the narrowest of margins, 31 shots to 29. Tomigo Road and Cabbage Street Road were never designed to carry large volumes of traffic. But since the National Highway wound its way to Freeman's Waterhole, more and more cars are using the connection between Hexham and Williamtown rather than backtracking to cross the Stockton Bridge. In two years, 25% more traffic is using the road, according to a study carried out by the Newcastle Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Average daily traffic on any working day has climbed to nearly 6,000 vehicles. So there is a combined uh, result of the diversion of traffic from the Stockton Bridge plus an enhanced interest in the Port Stephens area which will continue to grow because it's that much closer to Sydney now. The Chamber of Commerce says that since the freeway was pushed through to Freeman's Waterhole, this has become the preferred route through to Port Stephens. But even without that increased traffic, this road is in a state of disrepair. Today's wet conditions showed the road at its worst. Potholes forced traffic onto the wrong side of the road, and in some low-lying sections, the road is covered by water. The Chamber of Commerce says the state government should upgrade the road now as part of the infrastructure needed to make Williamtown a major regional airport. Now, if that's to be the case, and Williamtown were to become a regional airport, the Cabbage Tree Road and Tomago Road are the essential links to the route to Sydney and are therefore part of the regional infrastructure. If we're going to develop uh, Williamtown as a, a major airport, and if we're going to develop Port Stephens as a recreational area for the benefit of the state, then the infrastructure has to be provided by the state. You can't expect the local ratepayers to fund that by themselves. Newcastle High's science block was out of bounds for students today as contractors worked to repair the damage caused by Friday's gale force winds. This six pane window was blown in, frames and all, as was this door. It happened just two minutes before the lunch break when the area would have been packed with children. This stairway would have had about 200 children going down for lunch when these windows collapsed. There would have been uh, a major disaster, there's no two ways about it. With the block's seven classroom laboratories temporarily off limits, the school has been forced to instruct some students to stay at home.
We selected Year 9 for today because they don't have the stress of a public examination coming up and they're old enough to look after themselves. It'll probably be Year 8 tomorrow if we make that decision. Structural engineers inspected the building late this afternoon and will recheck all its windows tomorrow morning. The block should be reopened on Wednesday. Bruce McKenzie, NBN News. Tony Rutley lost his arm in a mincing machine during the first year of his apprenticeship at Casino. While others would have found the task ahead daunting, Tony saw it as a challenge and within four months he was back at his trade and shortly after attending Hamilton TAFE. Wherever Tony goes, he leaves an impression. When Tony first came here, I was very impressed with his, with his attitude um, and I, I loaned him a white butcher's coat because that's the standard that we want here and I went to help, it on, help him on with it. On, the, on his very first day, and he, he turned around straight away and faced me and says, look, if I want a hand, he said, I'll ask for it. And from then on, I thought, well, this guy's heart is that big, must have been put in with tie levers. I was just that impressed. You know? Tony is in the top three of his class and always finding ways around any problem which confronts him. I think uh, he's, seen the, he's been at the face of adversity there with, with his injury. And... Um, He's, he's probably met all sorts of, of people in society and, and because of that I think it, it's created an openness in him that um, he can handle any situation at all. But Tony sees nothing special in what he's doing. It's a job and to earn money he must do it as well as anyone else. It was hard at first but I've adapted to it. And, um, it's just come natural there. Gives it to Butterfield. Butterfield now gets under range coat. Goes straight through Tony Butterfield. Tony Butterfield. Prop forward Tony Butterfield and centre Jeff Doyle are two of the biggest and fastest men on the paddock. They're also pretty large in the eyes of these young fans who took a little time out from competition at the Newcastle Small School Sport Carnival to meet the men they look up to. Signing autographs is all in a day's work for a night. One admirer used his head to capture a signature but most were keen to see the big men run. Yes! Jeff and Tony up against some pretty tough competition here today. Yeah, mate, uh, this should be a pretty good event. We've uh, got some pretty uh, town class runners here and um, I'd say we'll give Jeff's, t Jeff's team a bit of a flogging. You're meeting one another for the finish? Yeah, we'll be running the last league each and I'm, I'm sure I can handle Tony. But the, <laughs> be the best thing about the event is that, I hope Alan McMahon's watching, you'll see Tony running tonight, which means he'll have to train. A relay race was settled on. The Knights players taking the final baton. Butterfield streaked to the lead, showing he should be on the fit list for Friday night's match against Parramatta.
The accident happened just after 1pm in the Great Northern Seam. The Westpac rescue helicopter was called in at a quarter to two and it stayed for more than two hours while paramedics were rushed to the accident site. The miner was part of a seven or eight man team working the number four unit two or three kilometres from the surface. Initial reports were unclear whether the walls or the roof of the mine had collapsed, trapping the man by a leg. Fellow workers and paramedics took 10 minutes by shuttle car and then 10 minutes on foot to reach the injured man, reinforcing the roof with timber as they went. But the man died before he was brought to the mine surface. It is the second death at the Walra mine in the past 12 months. Crew deputy Harry Smith died after being crushed by a shuttle car last year. A police investigation is now underway into today's accident. Meanwhile, the mine has stopped operations for 24 hours as a mark of respect. Rebecca Skinner, NBN News. Though the buildings were only officially opened today by Minister for School Education Virginia Chadwick, they have been in use since Term 1. Until then, the school was made up entirely of demountables. It took less than a year and a half to build the New Look School, which boasts seven classrooms, a hall, administration block and canteen. The school is particularly proud of its library. Already parents have donated books worth more than $4,000. Mrs Chadwick promised that $300 million will be spent by the government this year on school buildings throughout the state, with the rapidly growing central coast one of its priorities. That uh, and the north coast and indeed the outer western suburbs of Sydney, they are our three major pressure points in terms of uh, significant population growth and hence uh, legitimate demands and need for new uh, school accommodation. Already pupils have put their demountable school behind them and are busy landscaping the area where they once stood. They now look optimistically to the future. I think he now is going to either have to continue a massive build-up on the border to deal with a very serious type of invasion, or he is going to try to play the Arab card. And by that I mean try to divide the Arab world into rich and poor, into those nations he can influence and those he can't, and to somehow make the United States and the West the enemy and distract the entire Arab world and other states from the fact he's an aggressor and has seized Kuwait. That's a political option. What about the military initiative? Can he now move into Saudi Arabia or has the United States managed to get in place in time? We're not in place in time yet, Peter. They can keep building up for weeks if necessary and we would find ourselves constantly with the same problem that they would have superior ground forces. But we can certainly wreak almost a devastating air attack on both Iraqi forces and Iraq itself. A question of politics again. Someone has just uh, quoted a senior U.S. official to tell us that the U.S. has been in touch today also with two of Iraq's traditional enemies, Syria and Iran. What does that mean? Well, I think one thing we cannot do is allow Saddam Hussein to unite any aspect of the Arab or Islamic world around him. And those contacts may do a great deal to prevent him from wrapping himself in the mantle of the title Arab and somehow escaping the fact that he has been a merciless aggressor.
In the best of all worlds, sending American forces to Saudi Arabia would freeze Iraqi troops, they would not attack Saudi Arabia, and there would be no fighting. Then, with a military stalemate on the ground, the U.S. and its friends would use a naval blockade to squeeze Iraq's economy. In two or three months, that would, in theory, so hurt the Iraqis that Saddam Hussein would either withdraw his forces from Kuwait or be thrown out of office by an unhappy populace. That's the best planners could hope for, but analysts say it is far more likely that there will be fighting of some kind, that Saddam Hussein will not back down without a long struggle. One scenario envisions tens of thousands of Iraqi troops trying to capture Saudi oil fields while encountering a blistering air attack from Saudi and American bombers. Another envisions a hostage situation requiring a U.S. military response or an Iraqi air attack on a U.S. ship. Iraqi Exocet missiles, for example, once nearly sank the USS Stark by accident. But most feared is Iraq's arsenal of poison gas, which on missiles fired from Iraq can hit targets anywhere in Saudi Arabia. Anytime you deal with somebody who has used chemical weapons on the battlefield, you are concerned about it. It would be intolerable. It would uh, be dealt with very, very severely. What the president is talking about is among the worst of the scenarios. Poison gas could cause a large number of casualties and would call for a massive U.S. response. Some planners say that response at the extreme could include nuclear weapons. John McWethy, ABC News, the State Department. Launched in earnest on Wednesday, the campaign saw 10 inspectors take to the road, each assigned the task of visiting building sites in a designated zone. Upon finding work in progress, the men would request an approved building application be produced. If none was available, a quick check could be made on the work's legality over the radio. But more often than not over the three days when that check was made, the answer was not what it should have been. Of the 268 sites visited, 148 were found to be unapproved. And of that, a further third was seriously in breach of regulations. Well, major work has been undertaken, um, or the work is um, unsatisfactory and doesn't comply with the requirements of the uh, building regulations. Uh, and in many, some cases, the builders are not licensed. Harold Stewart of Council's Health and Building Department said the trend was disturbing but not surprising. He said in the rush to restore homes to normal, many property owners had been too quick to get work underway. Some were not even aware all works costing more than $1,000 had required an application. There could, however, said Mr Stewart, be no such excuse for the builders. I like to plead ignorance, of course, but um, uh, licensed builders know that approvals are required and really it's no excuse. The department will now sift through the mounds of reports resulting from the blitz and using observations and in the worst cases photographs will decide what action will be taken. Though for some builders the writing is on the wall. And we are going to refer the matters to the Builders Services Corporation and uh, certainly those unlicensed builders may find themselves uh, in a fair bit of hot water and I'd suggest that the licensed builders might also be um, jeopardising their licence. Is some of the work that's been carried out that was unauthorised and is serious, can you order that to be uh, yes. demolished? Yes, we can order it to be demolished. If it doesn't comply and it can't be made to comply, it will be demolished. It's the first of its kind for a high school in the region. 
Installed at a cost of $42,000, the Garaventa Stair Climber will enable disabled students to have the same access to the school's library and computer facilities as other students. Well, as a region, Hunter Region now is in the position to be able to offer uh, equality for any student who may wish to, or who is unfortunately disabled in any way, be it uh, from accident or sickness. Uh, they could have certainly apply to this school and receive the uh, full curriculum. The sun was smiling on Treasure Valley and sweet fiddle music flowed like the Big Snake River itself at the National Old Time Fiddlers Contest. It's a full week of fiddling and fiddling around. That's the mayor of Weezer. I'm not kidding. Jim Whitner won it in 55 and 56, then hung it up. Now he's fiddling again. So sure. why'd you come back? I mean, well, why does the duck go back to water? <laughs> They play three tunes, no sheet music, no electric instruments, and no trick fiddling. Hey, they said no trick fiddling. Judges don't see contestants or know who's playing. They listen for style, rhythm, and tone. Danita Rast of Humble, Texas came in second. Rudy Boer is the new champ. He's from Oregon, but plays like a Texan. Joey, who learned from the great Benny, taught Rudy. That's how it just keeps on going.